so at the NZZ, which we call the, the Neue Zürcher Zeitung for short, uh, I work in the visuals team with a bunch of really talented uh, colleagues. And the team is, is led by Barnaby Skinner, and it includes study journalists, designers, and software developers. And working in this team and in this journalistic field, what I really enjoy is the process of trying to make sense of the world. So when there is some kind of situation we report on, be it a global health crisis, a scandal, or, or a natural catastrophe, there is always at first a general lack of, of understanding. And the information that we have is fragmented, and it is not always clear what can be trusted and what not. And what we try to do is um, separate trustworthy information from this and misinformation, structure information, and connect and show the links between separate discussions and ideas, and provide context to the situation. And through this process, we try to make the different realities that these situations bring with them understandable and meaningful to our readers. Now, traditionally, journalism uses text and photos to do so. And relatively recently, uh, video and audio joined the arsenal of journalistic communication tools. Increasingly, illustration, information graphics, data viz, animation, and interaction are part of this collection of media that can be drawn upon to tell a story. So these visual tools have, like, have kind of left their place as decorative elements and have become visual arguments that translate these realities into something more tangible to our readers. And in the visuals team where I work, we concentrate on these media below to communicate a wide range of different kinds of stories. These stories use a variety of different information types we might bring historic events to life, um, as you see on the right, or evoke tragic stories um, like the one on the left about abuse um, through illustration. We provide instructions or explain abstract concepts through information graphics, also sometimes animated information graphics. And when we move from this more qualitative data to quantitative data, we communicate information that is officially available through governments or through other uh, organizations. And we do so using common statistical charts that we maybe create with our own charting tool, or we, we use kind of custom and sometimes even automated displays like you see on the right for the US election. But we don't only use official data sets, we also make our own. And one way to do so is to collect aggregated data and create custom information graphics and visualizations to communicate this data. Now, in these two examples that you see here, we collected this data on our own. So we, we researched different websites and brought together the data into a spreadsheet. For example, on the left, um, about the development of the coronavirus vaccine. But we also do this by collaborating with various stakeholders to gain access to or to create data sets. And I think that all our stories aim to make realities visible that are not already in the public domain. But these kind of stories do so very strongly on the data side. And so using these three projects as an example, I want to talk a bit more about these data collaborations and about our visualization process we went through to then communicate these newly found stories. So the first story is about showing which munip municipalities in Switzerland have been hit the hardest by the coronavirus. And for this story, we collaborate with the Swiss government to gain exclusive access to localized data. In Switzerland, the government publishes a variety of data about the coronavirus. And this, is, this data is published uh, at a cantonal level, but not on a municipal level. And this lack of detailed data is, is quite cumbersome when we are dealing with a virus that causes very localized outbreaks. Now, these municipalities are quite small. So in fact, everything in Switzerland is very small, also the municipalities. Um, so what, the smallest one has only 11 residents. And the reason people or the reason the officials don't publish uh, data on such a local level is to maintain people's privacy. So nonetheless, <laughs> in May this year, uh, Barnaby, who, who led this whole project, started a collaboration with the Swiss Federal Office for Public Health with the goal to get more granular data on infections, infection rates. And he and Nikolai, uh, who is a data journalist in our team, came up with the idea that would allow us to get this data without um, infringing on people's privacy. So what they did is they wrote a script, uh, which you see a part of here. And uh, the federal office would then run this script on their data. 
And this script returns the data in bin categories so that the exact number of infections um, is disguised in a range of numbers. So we never see this data, but we only receive the output of the process. And we could then use this, these binned uh, categories to visualize uh, infection rates uh, in the municipalities um, here using QGIS um, and uh, taking the form of a choropleth map. We also wanted to show an animation that kind of showed the development of the infections in different places, but unfortunately we didn't get that data because there were still some privacy concerns. But when the second wave hit, um, we could use uh, this interactive element um, that you see up here to allow the reader to toggle between the two waves. And what you really see here is how uh, in the, the first wave was very much localized in the south of, of Switzerland, and now in the second wave it has moved um, uh, towards the north. So this granular movement across Switzerland is something that becomes visible in, in this particular combination of data and visualization. And this um, interactive animation was uh, used as an introductory graphic to the whole piece. And then further down, there were also these zoom-ins into certain regions and comparisons again between the first and the second wave. Because we can't publish interactive maps at the moment yet, <laughs> um, we also published a separate article with these lists, with tables of data, and people could go and look for their city or their own municipality and look at the exact number and, and some additional information there as well. Um, and the data was also published on, on GitHub, GitHub. And it was really interesting to see because both, like the article that, that contained the map was very successful, but this one was as well. Uh, almost, there were almost as many people uh, reading this article. So it, it really showed how people um, want this hyperlocal um, data and want to know what's going on around them. So in terms of the, the collaboration we had here, uh, we worked together with uh, official data providers in this case. Um, we created a, a script to maintain a, a privacy of people. And in terms of uh, visualization, what I found really interesting here was to think of animation as uh, the fourth information channel. So besides text, visualization and interaction, um, the an animation carries its own meaning, carries the information to the reader. And as I said before, we could show kind of local and granular data with this. So the next story is about uh, the Swiss COVID app. This app exchanges keys uh, via Bluetooth with people around you who also have the app. And in the case of an infection, you can enter the so-called uh, COVID code. And those who have saved your key because you were uh, hanging out with them um, will be alerted that they might possibly be infected. And after this app had been introduced, uh, the Office for National Statistics started to publish data on the usage of the app, so the download numbers and the active users. And the app was being downloaded, but the active users were very low. And we decided to look into that. So I started to sketch out how we could show this data. And at the same time, there was a discussion on Twitter that people had tested positive for the, for the coronavirus, but had not received the code. And one of our colleagues was looking into that story. So while I was experimenting with the visual form, I was beginning to wonder how people actually receive uh, the code. And what you see here is kind of a moment of admittance because this is about how far I got. Um, and I realized it's, there's not really very much information around about how this process should, should actually even work. So we started to reach out to Swiss officials, both on a national level and on a regional level, to figure out how people were receiving this code. Did they get it through the app or, you know, was there some official, uh, you know, did they get a letter that they had to open or a fax or something like that? Everything's possible. Um, but what we noticed is that they also didn't really know. So we kind of had to um, go on a, on a journey to find different parts of this process and put it together. And what we used is one way, kind of besides the classic uh, telephone or email, um, was this idea of collaborative sketching. Um, so we would kind of send sketches to these official places and then they would send us sketches back. And as you see, they have also some questions, question marks here as well in the process. So in the end, we found out that, you know, people who, who get tested 
Um, this test then goes to the laboratory and the laboratory rep uh, reports the results to uh, the attending physician, but also to the cantonal medical services. And um, the cantonal medical services are, are responsible for the contact tracing and they should also provide the code to the patient by telephone. Um, however, if like, this should theoretically, this could be a, quite a fast process, but if they have, if contact details are missing, they will have to go over the attending uh, physician to get this information. Or if they're at their limits um, in their contact tracing, it might take a while until they have time to try to contact the infected person and give them the code. So what the big revelation here was that it was not the app that was not working because there was a lot of critique about the app, but it, it was the process was actually subjected to human error and um, tied human resources, and that made it very inefficient. Uh, so in the article, we first show how many people have been infected, uh, which you see here, and how many people have uh, entered a code and how many codes have been generated. And uh, the headline here is, that a tenth of uh, the people who had been infected in, in this time range that we were looking at, uh, only a tenth had actually entered a code. And this was also um, the news that was picked up by other, uh, by other media organizations. Um, and then the, the diagram caused some discussions about how the process should actually be um, in, a, in an ideal world. I, I still don't think they changed it, unfortunately, but. Um, you know, there's hope. <laughs> um, so in this, like looking back on this project, um, in, in terms of the data collaboration, uh, I thought something that I want to continue to look into is this idea of visual research for data collection, working together with people um, through design methods um, and through visual inputs. Uh, the other thing that I think is always very helpful to think about is you know plotting every dot so in the ter in terms of the infections uh, and the codes that were entered just you know putting every person or you know even if it's just really a dot putting every person on the map putting every um every code uh, on the map or on your canvas um already has a different effect than when we show you know a bar chart um, especially if we use it as a kind of introductory graphic and the other thing is visual structuring. Already visual structuring is a great service I think we can bring to our readers, um, especially in these situations where things are unclear and hidden in, in, in bureaucracy. Here we revealed certain proportions that were somehow um, questionable or, or not, uh, not ideal and um, processes that had not been part of public knowledge yet and not part of official knowledge as well. So, the third project is about overfishing of the oceans uh, through Chinese fishing boats. And here we collaborated with a company and an NGO to get data that was, was not public, um, but also with different desks across the news organization, especially the international desk and the photo editors. And the starting point was that Vanessa and uh, Katrin from the international desk made a contact with Spire. Um, and Spire is a company that has around 100 satellites circling the Earth. They provided us with a data set that contains ship movements across a certain time range and also shows under which flag they are sailing. So ships use an automatic, uh, automated identification system, AIS, and this system is broadcasted by the ships and can be captured by satellites. So this is the first uh, trial visualization of, of a part of the data set um, and using this data, the process really started with a back and forth between visualization and, and data cleaning. So AIS tracking data, if, if you're interested, is, is actually very messy and quite incomplete. So in comparison to the airspace, where we have a lot of precise uh, tracking methods, there is actually very little oversight when it comes to tracking the activities of the fishing industry. And there are some technical issues did prevent the satellites from capturing consistent messages or prevent the, the ships from broadcasting these messages. But there is also the problem that some ships turn off or manipulate their signals to deter authorities from illegal activities. Going back and forth a little bit uh, between 
the data, cleaning the data set and visualizing it, we also then zoomed into certain uh, regions that the international desk was particularly looking at uh, to see different uh, patterns and I think it's it's quite uh, shocking how much these these patterns reveal. Uh, to the left you see the Galapagos Islands uh, and the exclusive economic zone and these ships are fishing just right in front or just at the border of this of this economic zone. Uh, and here you have a lot of uh, protected or well not protected but you have a lot of um, marine life that is, um, it, that is in danger of extinction. Um, to the right, you see Iran here, um, and the ships actually um, are allowed to fish there in the uh, exclusive economic zone um, because they have contracts with the Iranian um, government. And then again, we would also visualize the data just with very simple statistical charts to look at how uh, to, to kind of check if, if we were seeing the right things or, you know, if there were some kind of other um, anomalies that we didn't see in the maps. And then based on what we found there, we would, and what we found in the maps, we would also talk to the people who were providing this data. So we talked to Spire, who live in Germany, who are um, placed in Germany, and we talked to Global Fishing Watch um, in the US, uh, while the, the international desk was talking to eyewitnesses in Iran and Ecuador. On a visual side, we, were, uh, we wanted to show the animals that were being fished. And I worked together with one of our illustrators, Anja Lemke. And with her, I also developed kind of the visual style of the whole article. Now, as we were working on the article in our, our, our content management system and placing these, kind of visually shaping the, the article, the, the text was also being edited at the same time. And by the time the text had kind of been, been finished, um, it was a little bit a different story than in the beginning. And the senior editor, Patrick Zoll, um, felt that such images, um, as you see here from our, from our photo editors, um, are better at portraying these um, kind of the horrors that comes with some of these illegal activities. So we kind of ditched the, the illustrations or we'll use them for another time. And we instead decided to go with these photos. Again, in the article, the map is kind of an introductory graphic, and then we have these zoom-ins and the images in between, and also statistical charts that show, um, for example, here, how big the Chinese uh, fishing, um, uh, how many sh uh, ships um, China actually has. So here, uh, in terms of data collaboration, I think there was a lot about understanding the messiness of the data together with different stakeholders. Um, on the visualization side, we use different media to invoke, invoke multiple story layers. Uh, so the images, uh, you know, invoke a different, invoke a different atmosphere, a different, uh, a different world than the maps do. And uh, we used visualization here to show something that is, you know, far off from land, so to say. So um, show and show the horrors of an industry that is, is not always easy to um, grasp. So those are the three uh, projects. I, I'm coming to an end now. Um, I've, there are a few ideas and questions that I would like to take with me in my further work. Um, one is the question if media organizations are the new data providers and if yes, what, you know, what does that mean? What kind of responsibilities arise from this new role? Then the other question is when does you know, research stop and visualization begin? And is there a way where, that we can use design methods uh, more strongly like this collaborative sketching um, to uh, tell visual stories, to research visual stories? And finally, how does our point of view uh, influence our reporting? I mean, this is a big question, of course, um, but I think what is really interesting is that um, now in the two first projects that I showed you, we are, you know, our perspective is from, from, from the middle of the country on a national level and also from the middle of a crisis, from the middle of this global pandemic. And the, second st the third story I, I showed you about the fishing activities is very much uh, told from this outside perspective. And I think it's interesting to think about what these different points of views, um, how these different points of views show in the story.